This is Whitley Strieber, and you have made a courageous choice. You're listening to Dreamland, a truly free, non-commercial voice on the Internet. We say it like it is. We take you where others will not take you. Dreamland, welcome to the edge of the world. This is William Henry sitting in for Whitley Strieber. This is Dreamland. Have you noticed that history appears to repeat itself or that revolutions also tend to be repeated? Here's a cyclical revolution that intrigues me. Circa 1350 BC, the mystic and charismatic Egyptian pharaoh Akhenaten launches a religious revolution in Egypt by promoting the religion of the Aten, dedicated to the light that illuminates the sun and symbolized by a shining disk. His revolution spins Egypt into chaos, not seen again until, well, the time of Jesus and then later even Woodstock. The army steps in, restores order. Eknaton is labeled a heretic. Memory of him and his mystic teaching is erased from Egyptian history, and the light is dimmed. 1,400 years later, the mystic Jews known as the Essenes leave Jerusalem, go to Egypt, launch a religious revolution, and tell the story of the translated or perfected ones. Scholars believe the Essenes renewed the religion of the light of the Aton. The Essene revolution ends with the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, who fulfilled the Essene plan to introduce a new, perfect human being. This revolution is also stamped out, this time by the army of Rome in AD 70, and the light is dimmed again. Another thousand years later, the Cathars of southern France revive the Gnostic teachings of the light and are met with massive resistance, this time from Pope Innocent III, who launches the crusade against the Cathars to eliminate Catharism in southern France. As many as one million men, women, and children Cathars are exterminated in the first European genocide to prevent the secrets of the light and perfection from becoming known. And the light is dimmed again. Only now, today, from our historical vantage point, are we able to connect the dots between these revolutions of Akhenaten, the Essenes, and the Cathars. We are the fulfillment of those revolutions, and the light remains within us. Here today to help us further connect these dots is Annika Corman, who's also known as Jean Daoud. If you've been following my steps on the path of the Cathar mysteries, especially those of Ren Le Chateau, you will want to know Annika's work. She's a private guide and expert on the history and mysteries of this powerful X spot. And subscribers can listen to my revelation, Revelations interview with her about her earlier book, White Lie. Annika is a storyteller. For over 35 years, she has been researching the hidden history of mankind and its religious and cultural path through the past. She has visited many countries, including Italy, Greece, Turkey, Israel, Egypt. And in 2000, she and her husband, Peter, settled on Akhetan soil. She has since discovered just how rich of an area this area is of southern France and how important its role was throughout history and still is. From southern France, land of the Cathars, Mary Magdalene, the Knights Templar, Ren Le Chateau, and much more, we welcome Annika Cormans to Dreamland. Welcome, Annika. Hello. How are you doing? Very well. It's so nice to hear your voice, and uh, can only imagine the beautiful picture you must be seeing looking outside your window. Yes, it's it's a gorgeous area. Love following you on Facebook, Annika. Your your pictures of Akitan are absolutely stunning, gorgeous. Yeah. Really contain the light of that area, and always take me back to some really wonderful memories. Oh yeah. Today, Annika, we want to talk with you about your latest work, The Eye of Ra. It intrigues me deeply because it connects areas of deep mystical importance, especially the subject of Akhenaten and ancient Egypt. So tell us about your book. Yes, well, The Eye of Ra, it, uh, it touches Akhenaten's uh, mystery and history. We don't know much about him because, like you said, uh, his memory has been almost literally hacked out of history because he was the pharaoh that became a heretic. It's the other way around in this case. It's uh, the, um, you know, Egypt had been worshipping so many deities up until Akhenaten and said, no, I want only, uh, I want you to worship only Aten Ra. 
so he introduced a sort of monotheism, which only lasted for like maybe 12 or 13 years. His reign was 17 years, and uh, then he was quickly removed, and then everybody turned back to Amun and all the other gods and goddesses of Egypt. And um, he sort of always, he, he has intrigued me since I was a child. I've always wanted to know more about him. So I've been having him on my agenda to write a book about for a long, long time. And um, as always, I want to mix adventure with, uh, with history and uh, possible history, because I'm always throwing in a theory of my own. And um, it's, it's difficult to get your finger on the, on the spot, of course, when you're talking about Akhenaten. But I'm giving it a good try and sharing what I've learned throughout my life uh, about this very, very special period in time. Egypt's famed 18th dynasty was a time of incredible magic and mystery that gave us some of history's greatest teachers of the hermetic mysteries. Hatshepsut, the star child who became pharaoh and married a commoner who discovered the secrets of transfiguration. Tutmosis III, the so-called Napoleon of Egypt, who the Rosicrucians claim as their founder and produced that mystical white powder of gold, the manna, musket that fed the light bodies of the pharaohs. And then we get on the throne a mystic and visionary pharaoh, Amenophis IV, who comes to the throne and, as you noted, promptly launches this religious revolution that spins Egypt into total chaos. Talk about, if you could, Annika, just what was the real revolution that Akhenaten wanted to, to, uh, to begin, and, to, and what did he want his people to feel as a result of that? That's a very difficult question, because I would have to take a guess. Um, I think Akhenaten came from a background. I think his grandfather was um, uh, not an Egyptian. I think he has been influenced by um, the, the Hebrews. And um, I think that is the reason why he thought that maybe everything was going wrong at that time. Maybe if they would convert to a sort of Egyptian form of Yahweh, which would be Aten in that case, Aten Ra, the sun god, uh, the soul Invictus, um, then maybe Egypt would be saved. But what he didn't know is that he plunged Egypt into an economic uh, disaster because uh, the, the multi-deities that, you know, every, everybody worshipped so many gods and goddesses, the economy flourished because of that. And taking that away from the people means that there was not enough money going into all that anymore. So the economy just sank to the bottom and... Um, it's, it's an interesting period because he, w he would never be able to, to keep that up. This was an, a huge change that he wanted way too quickly. And, but he did, um, he did make a point. So I think um, for Egypt, that was um, his way of trying to save the land and trying to get to a core, to, to the heart of everything that all the other gods and goddesses were all part of really one god, and that everything came from Art and Ra. Akhenaten is sometimes shown as having a long, slender, almost serpentine neck, long face, sharp chin, almond-shaped or cat eyes. People, thanks to ancient aliens and other extraterrestrial-themed shows, look at him and say, it's got to be an alien. Was Akhenaten an alien, or was he just an earthly person that had some very strange uh, features attached to him? I think the Amarna art is very interesting, because um, up until they used the Amarna art at that time, um, the, the images of Akhenaten and his family were quite normal. So I think the Amarna art uh, existed around a topic. Uh, it's like we introduced the Jugend Steel or Art Deco. It, it's like a, an art form that maybe he wanted to try and merge the male and female parts of God and uh, become one, uh, both in male as in female. And uh, that, that influenced the art, the art form. 
another explanation for the elongated head and headgear of Akhenaten is that it wasn't meant to cover alien origins, but rather it's symbolic of a heightened state of consciousness introduced by Akhenaten. It's, that would be similar in meaning to the yellow headgear of the Dalai Lamas, who are also shown with an activated crown chakra or yellow, yellow hat. What are your thoughts on that, Annika? Yes, uh, the color yellow is very interesting because, for instance, in China, only the emperor was uh, allowed to wear uh, yellow. And yellow, of course, is the color of gold and the color of the sun. And therefore, it was a royal color. It was color of, uh, of God. And um, so I think when you when you look at the color yellow, then um, you will get back to the color of gold, and that that explains why gold has always been so incredibly important to the old empire. We're going to in uh, later segments, Annika, be tracing how the the mysteries of the Atan might have uh, manifested in the teachings of the of the Essenes and also influenced mystic Christianity and perhaps even later the Cathars. There is without question a, a secret of the light or a perhaps a consciousness that we can tap into that enables us to to apprehend those secrets. Do you think Akhenaten was a was a a walking talking illuminated being? In other words, was he a was he a, a true avatar? I think so. I think, in a way, Akhenaten was um, one of those beings that um, that was illuminated, that had a, a certain idea that he knew that um, the vibration that comes off of the sun was the life bringer, and he exposed himself and also his guests sometimes. Um, to the sun, because that was the god, that was the life bringer, and all the food had to be in the sunlight. The temples in Akhetaten were without roof. Everybody was in the temple, and they were in the sun. So the sun was the main source of life, and um, he understood the vibrational power that we are now only starting to rediscover in science. Did you happen to see that Stanford University report recently that the sun is a actually a musical instrument, that it rings like a bell, and it's sort of like, plays like an organ? Oh, really? No, I haven't. And you hear things like that. And they also have uh, Stanford, they, they published the, uh, the Song of the Sun. It's a, like a hum or a drone, but they, they say the sun actually plays a million separate notes all at once. And it just makes me wonder, did Akhenaten, when he's shown in those portrayals on those limestone reliefs, is he, he's, he's receiving the key of life from the sun. And, and you wonder, is that purely symbolic, or did he literally breathe in or inhale a key or vibration into his own body that perhaps infused him with the light of the Atan? It's quite possible. I think there is a, a lot that we don't understand or don't understand anymore. And um, if you go back to uh, what you mentioned, Rosicrucianism, um, I'm, I'm a Rosicrucian, I'm a member of the Amorc. And the Amorc is actually the, um, the, the order that goes back to Akhenaten and his father, um, Amenophis III. And the start of the mystery school is also the... You know, it's the same thing as the Hermetic teachings. It's the study of the uh, meta, uh, metaphysics, so um, the vibrations and things that you cannot see with your, you know, with your eyes or touch with your senses or understand with your five senses. It's something that goes beyond that. And um, uh, in that way, I think Akhenaten was indeed an avatar. We're speaking, excuse me, we're speaking with Annika Corman. She's the author of The Eye of Ra. Her book is available at Amazon.com. Get a copy of it. Dive into this mystery. Cross over time periods with, with Annika. She weaves you through these incredible mystic secrets and brings it back to ourselves and asks us the ultimate question, what's inside of me and how can I light that light within me? This is Dreamland. We're continuing with Annika Corman. She's the author of The Eye of Ra. Annika, before we uh, go forward and talk about the Urim and Thummim, 
Talk about your, your nom de plume, your AKA, and, and tell us where that came from. Yes, shout out dot. Well, I'm, uh, I'm, the, the funny thing is that when I started to look for a nom de plume when I was writing White Light, I thought I, um, I was just looking at where my family was coming from, and I found out that they came from some France. And uh, that at that time, they were called the family out. And I thought maybe I could use a nom de plume based on that name because I'm sort of uh, returning to that heritage in a way. Of course, it's 700 or something year ago. It's a long time ago. But still, I think it's nice to, to uh, have a nom de plume based on, on ancestors. And um, so I just changed Annika into Jeanne because that's the French version of Annika. And uh, and I added the D to make a statement. And so Jeanne Dout, it became. <laughs> Jeanne Dout, very nice. And thank you for helping me with the pronunciation. So Annika, <laughs> let's get to the, the one of the real gems in the book, literally, the crystal, the Urum and Thummim. Yeah. Tell us how yeah. that came into the story and, and, and what exactly the Urum and Thummim is. Well, ever since I was a child, I was uh, very, very intrigued by the, um, you know, the the old stories of the um, the Old Testament. And one of the things that has um, attracted my attention was the Urim and Thummim divination device. And I was like, what what is the di- divination device? You know, it was a black and a white stone. And I know that in Egypt, in ancient Egypt, they used the black and a white stone to help in judgment, in cases of judgment that. Um, it was unclear who was the sinner and, you know, who was innocent. And um, when they had no clue or whatsoever who, who did it, and they used the black stone and the white stone and they threw it on the floor and it would speak to the high priest. And um, in the time of um, Moses and Aaron, there was a mentioning of Stones just like that, a black and a white stone that they called the Urim and the Thummim. And the high priest, Aaron, used them exactly like that. He used them as a help, an aid in, uh, in uh, divination or in uh, doing justice, uh, having um, to, to find out whether somebody was guilty or not. So um, to find out the black and the white stone. And how that white stone became the eye of Ra, because it was it had a double function. The white stone would be put on top of the staff of Ra, and then it would be held in the sunlight, and then it could actually lit a um, uh, fire. Of course, it's like uh, using it as a sort of laser beam. And I, yeah, thought, and you... I can imagine... Sorry? No, uh, you know, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt, inter- interrupt you. <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, the stone is interesting because of the double function, and it was called the Eye of Ra because Isis was called the Eye of Ra as being the daughter of Ra. So that's why I'm, uh, I was intrigued by it. And, of course, Jesus returns with the white stone in the book of Revelation with the new name of the Lord written on it. And, of course, those, there are those that believe the, the name of the Lord is actually the vibration of the Lord. So I suppose you could make an argument that in the book of Revelation, Jesus must have, by definition, the Urim and the Thummim, and maybe he's going to put that that stone on stop on top of a some kind of a holy stick. Well, you know, it's yeah. funny that you mentioned this, but I think that if you put Jesus into um, this, the the son of a king, if he really is a royal, then um, he would have had things like that. He would have had. Um, uh, the old um, artifacts that... Well, he was uh, the high priest of the Order of Melchizedek, too, so by definition, he would have to yeah. have these tools or these devices. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if he had something like that. And, and it could have been the original, but it could have also been uh, copies or stones just like that. So do you think that the, the Urim and Thummim then existed at the time of Jesus? Where were they then? I have no idea. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea. It, uh, uh-huh. It's it's an interesting thing to to see if we can find it in the, in the historical records. And um, like you said, it's 
it's nice to to notice little things like that. And you, you just wonder, is this is there an actual holy stick that the high priest might have possessed, and they put the stone on top, and like in an Indiana Jones moment, right? I think you even talk about that in the book that. There's that scene, or, or why don't you talk about that? That scene in, in the Indiana Jones where they they're possibly using what uh, we could we, we could think of as the Urim and Thummim. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the Eye of Ra, the light stone, the white stone, uh, was used as a lens and uh, put on top of the stick of the uh, the staff of Ra and um, and used. So um, it's it's a very interesting thing. You can see it. It's um, also in, in in the Hobbit movies. You can see it as the Arkenstone, which is a fantastic name, Arkenstone. Arkenstone. You know, it's Ark, you know. <laughs> so it's interesting. Maybe the Eye of Ra ended up in the Ark, in the Ark of the Covenant. It's maybe one of the pieces that was inside and that needed to be resembled. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it just seems like what we're trying to get to here and have been trying to get to for at least a generation. I mean, you talk about the books of Lawrence Gardner and, and others who have written about the Holy Grail and, and start to look at it from a real mystical perspective, and especially Gardner is one who goes back to the reign of Akhenaten, and, and, and we're going to talk in, in the next segment about uh, Flinders Petrie and your discussion of, of – or Petrie, rather, and his discoveries of, about the Urim and Thummim. I mean, Lawrence Gardner followed Petri around and said, look, what, what he was actually discovering, what he actually found was the alchemical yeah, workshop yeah, yeah. of Akhenaten, where they're producing this okay. highly energetic substance called manna or the white powder gold or whatever term you want to use for it. And I think what we're finally trying to get around to is viewing people like Akhenaten and Jesus and, and others as, as more than just kind of two-dimensional figures. And we're starting to see them in action, gathering these tools, assembling these kits of tools, and actually using them for spiritual purposes. Yeah, quite possible. It's, it's a difficult subject uh, because it's, uh, for, for a lot of people, it's, it's a lot of guessing and it, I think when you when you go back inside of yourself, inside of your heart, uh, that is where you can find the um, the metaphysical stone. And, um, and, and maybe, and, yeah. And, and how would you how how would we know when we find that metaphysical stone? What would what would that do for us? What would that bring into our life that we perhaps presently don't have? That is the moment when you use the art of reflection and the art of polarization and draw yourself up from um, a certain existence. The art of polarization and uh, reflection is hermetic teachings. It goes straight to the Kabbalion. And uh, when you apply this in your life, then you use the stone. Then you use your, your inner ability to rise above that was uh, that that what is only material so you you're using um uh, how how can i well read the eye of ra <laughs> it's all in there <laughs> it's how how you apply the laws of the kabbalion and the laws of um the um your your philosopher stone inside of you how how can you apply that in your life how do you do this it's it's all in the book each of us then gets to kind of define it in our own way, but there are an actual set of of laws, not really rules, but but a program, a, a program that we can access and, and implement. Yeah, I think it's a way of life and a philosophy and a conduct. And the moment that you are uh, focusing on conduct, not just to be a nice person and to, to be pleasant in your surroundings, but also to be pure between the ears, which is much more difficult, uh, is, is that of an Essene, of a Qatar. Uh, it's what, what we are striving to become, is a pure one, and to be completely um, uh, pure in thought and in conduct is what would eventually be the polishing of the diamond. 
this is a, a subject we talk about a lot on, on Dreamland Annika, this idea of how we attain purity. Another term for it is perfection. And we're, we're living in an age of, uh, of, of technology when you have the biggest corporations in the world, Google, Apple, others, believe and are staking billions of dollars on this, the, the possibility, and, and in their view, the probability that we can perfect the body. We can increase our longevity. We can increase our intelligence by a thousandfold. We can be, attain superhuman powers. These are many of the things that they, the ancients said that they derived from clicking into a, a consciousness. Do you think that we're like going into a real dark age here with the, the, the possibility of this technology being going into our bodies? Or do you think it's possible that we can attain it, or, or create an age of light along with an age of technology? Yes, I think the realm that is uh, important at this moment in time is the realm of thought and the realm of love. And I think the power of love is um, it's undervalued because um, the moment that you do everything with love, even cooking, uh, getting out of bed, uh, taking a shower, uh, whatever you do, if you do this with love, you enlighten, you, you almost literally um, get lighter. You um, illuminate your moment, your second, your breath, your inhaling, your food, everything, with a certain substance that we cannot really understand. But it is, that is the realm that we're talking about. And, and I think in the first century, um, Jesus also said that the kingdom is not out there, it's not here or there, it's, it's in here, we already are our kingdom. And that particular power that we have to heal ourselves, to stand above, to get above the material thing that drags you down, to get out of that mud of existence, that is love. And... Um, I've been through quite a lot in the past two years, and um, I've, beca I've also become very ill because of, you know, I was shocked by somebody's behavior. So, for for one moment, the only thing that saves me from getting worse is love. Just to focus on this love is like focusing on food. It's a it's a food from the other world. And that gets you through everything. It, it lightens you up, it heals you, and it makes you stronger. And through all that, I was able to write a book. And through all that, I was able to share whatever I went through in a very, very positive way, in a very loving way. So I think, yes, you're, the, the answer is yes, you can get out of this. You can get out of the mud of life by using love and purity. Annika's book is The Eye of Ra. You can get it at Amazon.com. It's a wonderful mystery with, loaded with mystic treasures, discussions about the Urim and Thummim, takes you back to the realm of the reign of Akhenaten, Nefertiti, one of the most powerful times in human history.